Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 3rd of November and this quick look ahead at the week beginning the 6th of November with me, Michael Hewson. Um, we've seen quite a turnaround uh, this week. Um, big gains in equity markets over the last three to four days. Um, coming off the back of six weeks of losses for the DAX, um, two weeks of losses for FTSE 100 and the S&P 500. Oil is down, looking like it's going to finish lower for the second week in a row. And yields are tumbling. And it looks like yields could also fall for the second week in a row. But ultimately, what really has changed? The economic outlook continues to look difficult. Certainly the earnings announcements that we've seen thus far this week have warned about that, but I think the problem with low expectations is if you set them low enough, it's quite easy to beat them. And even though European markets saw their best one-day session in three weeks on Thursday, with the DAX closing at a two-week high, um, tumbling yields, the expectation that central banks are pretty much done when it comes to hiking rates. We obviously saw the Federal Reserve earlier this week, keep rates on hold. Um, there wasn't really too much of a surprise to that. Um, Powell certainly wants to keep his options open when it comes to um, the prospect of another rate hike. Certainly there is room for another rate hike um, in December on the basis of their dot plots for 2023. I think a lot will depend on the data that we've seen or that we're going to see over the course of the next few weeks. But certainly based on the data that we've seen this week, um, particularly around manufacturing, uh, the US economy is certainly showing signs of weakness, but it's been showing signs of weakness for the past 12 months. So nothing new there when it comes to manufacturing, ISMs, PMIs, and what have you. It's not just a US problem, it's a global problem. Manufacturing has been struggling um, for a while. It's services where you're seeing some of the um, significant areas of growth. And that was certainly borne out in the GDP numbers that we saw out of the US um, in October, 4.9% um, annualized gain in third quarter GDP for the US. We've got UK third quarter GDP out in the coming week. We'll be lucky if we even get close to that. I think we'll be lucky if the economy even grows. And obviously, that's a big data item out for the week ahead. Um, we had the Bank of England this week. No surprises there again. Um, rates kept unchanged. There was a 6-3 split in the rate vote. Three members of the MPC voted for a rate rise. All external members, Catherine Mann, Megan Green and Jonathan Haskell. Um, so there is still concern about elevated um, inflation levels. Certainly the Bank of England seems to think that the wage growth number um, out of the UK is probably a little bit on the high side. It's been around about 7.8% for the last three months. They estimate it that it's closer to 7%. Whether it is or it isn't, inflation still remains very high. And obviously we've got the latest October inflation report due in just over two weeks time. And that's likely to see another big fall um, or a big slowdown in headline inflation as the October energy price cap um, from last year drops out of the equation or the calculations. And consequently, I think that it's very unlikely that we will see um, another rate hike from the Bank of England. And really now what markets are starting to price is the prospect of, OK, higher for longer, but when's the first rate cut coming? Um, and in the case of the ECB, I'm a little bit puzzled by the fact that the markets seem to think that the ECB has got another rate hike in it. I mean, I'm sorry, but I just I just can't get behind that at all. And yet the euro continues to outperform. Um, if anything, the European economy and the German economy is in a worse state than the UK economy. So please don't tell me that the ECB has got another rate hike in it, because I think if they wanted to kill the economy even more than they already have, that's exactly what they will do. So at some point in the first half of next year, I think we'll see the ECB start to cut rates. Um, 
the, the only the only concern that I have that the Fed might be might not be done is if UK um, US economic data continues to remain resilient. And obviously, we've got the payrolls report later today. Um, weekly jobless claims still coming in around 210, 217,000. Yesterday, ADP was weak, but ADP was also weak the prior month, and non-farm payrolls came in at 336,000. The whisper number today is for around about 185. We'll see whether or not that actually gets anywhere close um, to what estimates are for it. Ultimately, non-farm payrolls have beaten every single month this year. So I'm not convinced that November will be any different, given the fact that we've had Amazon say they're going to be taking on another 250,000 staff between now and year end um, in terms of seasonal hiring. So you would think that um, the US labor market is likely to remain fairly resilient. So there is an outside chance that the Fed could go again. Personally, I, I think it's I don't think it's likely, but it's certainly not as cut and dried as, say, for example, the Bank of England and the ECB. I think they're done. Um, and really, it's a question of when does the next when when does when does the first rate cut come? Consequently, as a as a result of this week's central bank meetings, the fact that what's going on in the Middle East looks contained for the moment, that's reflected in um, the declines that we've seen in oil prices over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, that could still flare up. That is the elephant in the room. And that could really upend all central bank inflation expectations when it comes to energy prices. But certainly, if we look at what's happened over the course of the past few days, we were well overdue a bounce, if I'm honest. Um, we were approaching some really key support levels um, on, say, for example, the, the, the DAX and the FTSE 100. Um, and we've seen a very decent rebound again from the low 7200, 7250 area and we're heading back but it's important to understand as with any downtrend you're always going to get reaction you're always going to get reactions off the support levels and that's exactly what we're getting today so we're going to see a, a fairly decent rebound we've come off um three months of declines for equity markets and consequently particularly the dax and the s p and it's about time that we saw a little bit of a rebound because as with any weakness or strength it's very it's very unusual for it to be in a straight line so we're getting a fairly decent rebound here we could head back to all 7400 7500 certainly if yields continue to fall that the way that they have been that is certainly going to be a case in point if we look at the us 10 year in the last two weeks we've gone from five percent to 4.65 so we've seen a significant decline and in, in the course of the past couple of days we've seen a 25 basis point drop in yields so that gives you an indication as to what the market is thinking when it comes to the outlook for rates going forward obviously that's very short term but it also ties in with the rally that we've seen in equity markets um, as shown on this FTSE chart similar sort of story on the DAX, seen a fairly decent reaction off these lows down here. Retested the March lows. We've rebounded. We can see the extent of the rebound, but look, still in a downtrend. So we're still making lower lows. Um, and unless or until we break above this blue trend line, the 50 day moving average, then really what we're looking to do here is still remain in the downtrend that we've been in since August, late July, early August. If we go and look at the S&P 500, it's pretty much a similar sort of story. Again, we've seen a really strong rebound off these lows at around about 4,100. We're trading around 4,300. We've obviously got the 50-day moving average here, which could act as a bit of a cap. Obviously, these highs back in October are also likely to be important, as well as this trend line through the highs from here. So again, we're making lower lows. Um, and until such times, as we take out these peaks here, then we could see, it, we, we could, we'll probably continue to see a similar sort of story play out when it comes to buying the dips, because there's an awful lot of data now between now and the end of the year, which could shift sentiment. And ultimately, that's really what we're all about in terms of being sentiment driven at the moment. 
NASDAQ 100 bounced off the 200 day moving average, is back and now back above this key support level here, 14,340. So that's likely to be a fairly decent area of support. We've, again, we've got the 50 day moving average on the NASDAQ and we've got the resistance from the highs back in July. So again, still in the downtrend, still lower lows, still lower highs until such time as that pattern is ch changes in any way, then really that's the way as a trader you have to play it. You have to play the trend in place at the time and the trend in place for the moment is very much a downtrend and until that cycle is broken um, that's 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 the mindset that you need to think of think of in terms of euro dollar still in that range really 107 105 and i think you can really sort of throw a blanket over that but again as with um, everything else we've talked about you know july to um, the lows in october lower highs lower lows so we really need to see a break of this 107.40 area and sustained to retest the 200 day moving average to break the cycle of that particular trend. It's the same thing on the cable as well. Um, it's amazing actually how different these are. Now cable does look as if it could be on the cusp of a breakout, but this is really messy here. Um, it's very difficult to articulate for an aggressive move higher in cable simply because we're not seeing it in euro dollar and generally these two do tend to move in tandem unless you see a big euro sterling move so just because you're seeing the potential for a breakout in cable doesn't necessarily mean that we will get one if anything it's probably worth drawing a line through these lows through here perhaps for evidence of a little bit of a support line and perhaps this is a little bit of a triangle through here the problem with that is it's so far into the apex now that it's almost irrelevant. It, it looks like that we're trading in a range between 120 and 123. Um, and this this triangle is probably just going to basically peter out into nothing. Euro sterling, similar sort of story here, though we are continuing to trend higher on euro sterling. So there is a risk that if we break above 87.40 in a meaningful fashion, then we could have held back to 87, 90, 88. So that I think is a fairly key resistance level um, on the Euro Sterling. If we can sustain that move, if we break below here, then we could retest the lows back at 86.20 back in October. So keep an eye on that. Again, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs there. Dollar Yen. I mean, I've, I've basically got Dollar Yen massively wrong this year. Um, and that's just one of those things. Um, I thought the Bank of Japan would be slightly more aggressive in terms of its tightening. It's not. It's basically procrastinating. And obviously, we've not been helped by the fact that US yields have remained um, fairly strong. We haven't seen a significant weakness there. So again, with dollar yen, there's a bit of a cap from the highs of last year, 151.95, 152. Um, so we're still in an uptrend there unless we take out this 148.75, 147.85, 148 area uh, and then start to sift, slip back into the Ichimoku clouds here. But for the time being, dollar yen remains very much by the dips. But I, I just, I, you know, I'm not comfortable buying it, but that, that's essentially where we are when it comes to dollar yen. Um, I don't know why I closed that. So let's quickly just reopen that. All my watch lists there. So this is the coming week. So what have we what have we got coming up? Well, and I think the bigger question is obviously we've talked about it a little bit. You know, can these gains be sustained? Well, yes, they can, um, but they can only be sustained in the short to medium term in the context of the downtrend that they are in. And I think that's the important thing because ultimately, over the course of the past few days. Nothing much has really changed. Yes, the geopolitical concerns have died down a bit. They are still there. They are still a clear and present danger to um, the global supply chains, the costs of oil and gas and what have you, because you've got still got Ukraine and you've still got the Middle East. And then you've got the backdrop of a slowing global economy. The, the economic data is not great. Um, the US numbers do appear to be showing fairly decent amounts of resilience but how long can that continue you know and i think that's the big question that we really need to ask ourselves going forward if we look at brent crude um, we can see from this chart here that yes we're seeing lower highs 
but we're also seeing higher lows. So we are getting what I would call a consolidation between these peaks here and these lows here. And we've seen a fairly decent rebound. We are no longer, uh, we are now starting to become a little bit oversold. And as I say, there's fairly decent support in and around $84 a barrel. And we're currently around about $88 a barrel on Brent crude. So we need to keep an eye on that. And gold is starting to show a little bit of softness in the short to medium term. We've seen a little bit of a pullback there. Um, obviously, I think the fact that geo, the geopolitical risk premium has subsided a little bit and we could see a drift back to 1960 in the short to medium term. It is looking a little bit overbought. And the 2000 area is always going to be a fairly psychological resistance level, hence why we've seen a little bit of a pullback and a little bit of profit taking over the course of the past few days. And also, you've got to bear in mind that seasonality, it won't be long now before people start to talk about that tired old cliche of a Santa rally. And you'll hear Bloomberg, CNBC, all the business channels talking about it. To my mind, it's a complete load of old nonsense, but ultimately it's a narrative that people like to run with. Um, what does it mean in the wider scheme of things? Not that much. Um, as we head into the end of the year, we're, you know, the equity markets have remained fairly resilient. It would be unlikely or unusual for equity markets to have two bad years in a row. So there is an element of the moment, I think, that people want to hope for the best. And at the moment, what we're seeing is an awful lot of chop. And we're likely to see an awful lot of chop between now and the end of the year. So we're not, hopefully we're not going to fall off a cliff. I think geopolitics could play a significant part in that. But ultimately, we're not going to make new record highs, at least not yet. So as we look ahead to the week ahead, um, for, for me, there, there's, it's a slightly lighter week this week. This week has been really heavy on, on economic numbers. Obviously, Apple has disappointed slightly on its China, China, China revenues, its China sales. Um, we've seen BP and Shell, um, mixed fortunes there. Um, the bank banking banking earnings are now behind us as well. So it's really about what sort of pre-Christmas period are we going to have as we head towards year end. And we're going to continue um, with third quarter GDP for the UK next Friday. Uh, the UK economy is likely to slow sharply in the second half of this year. The Bank of England has made it clear that it's not in any rush to cut rates anytime soon, and it wants to keep them higher for longer. In the first quarter, the UK economy grew by 0.1%, and then 0.2% in Q2. Q3, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna struggle to even get close to that. We could see stagnation, 0%, or even a modest contraction of minus 0.1%, given the weakness that we've seen in retail sales numbers since July, as well as other areas of the economy. Individual monthly GDP numbers have struggled to claw back the 0.6% contraction that we saw in July. We saw a 0.2% rebound in August, and, an, and we've got a similar 0.2% expansion forecast for September. We also have September data for industrial and manufacturing production um, this coming Friday, the 10th of November. And that is likely, to, and both of which have been negative for July and August. So we're not going to get a lift there. Construction has also looked a little bit on the weak side. So I think if we do get 0%, I think that'll be a result based on the data that we've seen thus far. Although it is a first iteration of Q3 GDP. So um, looking at the Australian dollar, because there is an outside chance that we might see another rate hike from the Aussie dollar. Um, the expectation is that the RBA will probably keep rates on hold, that we saw a slight overshoot um, in the recent inflation numbers, and that prompted a little bit of short covering in the Aussie dollar on an expectation that we might see um, the RBA do one more 25 basis point rate hike from 4.1% 4 to 4.35. Certainly, I think the Australian dollar remains very tied to the fortunes of the Chinese economy. We've got China trade for October, 
next week. That's been weak on both imports and exports um, for quite some time now. And I'm not expecting to see an improvement there. For China trade imports for the, for the 7th of November are expected to see a decline of around about 6.3% um, and a similar decline in exports as well for October. We've also got CPI and PPI um, out of China. I think that's two days later. And again, um, we're seeing signs of deflation or disinflation there. So you've got this disinflationary impulse spreading out from the Chinese economy that will and is already starting to manifest itself in the PPI numbers, which generally tend to lead CPI numbers um, in the UK, US and the Euro area. So that 65 level, 65 level on Aussie dollar is a very key resistance level going forward in the wake of any RBA decision, which is due on the Tuesday. We've got services PMIs coming out on the 6th of November, European services PMIs, they're likely to um, remain remain weak. Um, in France and Germany, services activity was solidly in contraction territory at 46.4 and 48 respectively in September. Spain and Italy are also expected to remain lacklustre, although they are much more resilient around about 50.5 and 49.9 in September. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not we see a slowdown in those numbers. Um, on the earnings front, slightly, slightly quieter week coming up. We've got UK retail with Marks and Spencers, who've had a really strong year, year to date. Um, their turnaround plan finally appears to be paying uh, dividends. Not so sure about their uh, Christmas video, I have to say, but ultimately I'm also not frothing at the mouth about it either. However, um, there is a fairly decent area of support all the way through. Here is this, the makings of a potential head and shoulders, left shoulder here, head, potential right shoulder here. So it'll be very interesting to see whether or not the first half numbers um, manage to meet the expectations the markets clearly have got or started to price in. So let's just stick a line through that. There we go. So around about 210p there on the Marks and Spencer share price. That's going to be a fairly key support level when they report their first half numbers on the 8th of November. We've also got ITV been hit hard by um, drops in advertising revenue. Um, if we zoom out there, we can see that it's not been particularly interesting. They have been diversifying their business model um, in recent months, um, investing in small businesses like plant-based food brand This, pain relief brand, brand Flarin, pet care company Pit Pat. Um, and I suppose if you boost the profiles of these small brands by allowing them to advertise on ITVX to grow their turnover, the hope is that the people who use these brands will um, obviously um, start turning their, um, their eyeballs to ITV content. I'm not totally convinced about that, but, you know, each to their own. Um, ITV Studios continues to do well and is likely to um, be um, the key area of growth in that particular side of the business. But as we can see from the share price, pretty uninspiring. We've also got the first numbers from Arm Holdings post IPO. Um, it's been fairly, fairly uninteresting, the performance of the share price uh, for Arm Holdings. And uh, in the first quarter of this year, it showed a $65.5 million loss. Um, total, next, total net sales declined to 10.8% in the quarter ended the, ending the 30th of June, with most of the fall being down to a 19.3% fall in royalty revenues. Now, ARM generates a lot of its revenues from licensing its intellectual property, and the slowdown in mobile phone and other electronic device sales impacted its revenues in the most recent quarter. So hopefully a pickup in phone demand um, will help um, offset that in the second quarter. Q2 revenues are expected to rise from the 675 million that we saw in Q1 to 749 million in Q2, with royalty revenues forecast to account for $449 million of that total.
So that's arm holdings, looking a little bit overbought, but again, you know, that's not to say that we can't um, head back higher towards those peaks of um, earlier uh, in September, October. Last but not least, we've got Disney, and obviously Disney Plus um, revenues has not been doing particularly well. It's been shedding subscribers hand over fist over the course of the past two or three quarters, unlike Netflix, which has continued to go from strength to strength. Um, Disney's been putting up its prices, um, also brought out an ad supported version, and recently, as early as this week, um, to basically bought out the remaining part of Hulu from Comcast that it didn't already own for eight and a half billion dollars. I'm not really sure what they're thinking there because Hulu can only be seen in the US. The US content market is at saturation point, and with the best will in the world, they're never going to make that eight and a half million dollars back in terms of revenues given the tight margins in the industry. So um, looking at the lows here, fairly decent support in and around this $78, which has managed to contain the weakness thus, thus far that we've seen so far this year. I think it'll be very interesting in Disney's Q4 numbers as to whether or not um, it can start to draw a line under its loss of subscribers and start um, Start, to start growing its revenues again. Q4 revenues are expected to come in at $21.42 billion, which is almost, which is $900 million lower than it was in Q3. Obviously the parks business is, is winding down, so you're not gonna get as, as, as much of much turnover there. And we're expected to see profits of 72 cents a share. So that is it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, suffice to say, obviously, I don't know what the non-farm payrolls numbers are um, for later today. Um, a weak set of numbers there could well keep the um, move higher alive in equity markets. But if we get a strong number, we could see yields pop higher and markets um, start to track lower after the gains of the last three or four days. So that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets. Thank you.